One of the interesting findings that I think that has come out of this work is that uh, data scientists spend a lot of time wrangling their data. That is, cleaning it up and formatting it to get it ready for analysis. And uh, what Joe's going to talk about today is uh, about, he's going to tell us about some of the tools that he and his team have developed to aid scientists in this wrangling process. Great. Is this, is this on? This microphone, can you guys hear me in the back? Yeah. Yes, all right, it is on. Wonderful. All right, well, um, I've been having really persistent uh, issues with my friends down at Apple since I upgraded my operating system. It pretty reliably comes back, but it takes a while. So we'll just fly blind for a few seconds uh, till we get the screen up. There we go. I just want to make sure we're at the right resolution because I want to show you a live demo of some software, and I want you to be able to see what's going on on screen. Oh, boy. All I did was say project. Well, we'll see how this works. All right. Um, so uh, I want to give a little background on a kind of Skunkworks research project that we kicked off at Berkeley. This is a project where we never raised any funding. Uh, we have a terrible website. Um, we didn't really uh, uh, market, so to speak, the research. And a hell of a lot of great stuff came out because of the kinds of people that you get together at Berkeley. When a bunch of people get together and decide to do some work, just things happen. So this project was called Data to the People, or D to the P. Uh, and you are welcome to go to the sort of uh, second tier website that we built for it if you want. Um, the theme of the work, which is something that a bunch of us had been talking about collectively, was look, it's, I think it was like 2010 at the time. Um, computing is becoming approximately free. So making things go faster isn't that much fun anymore. Uh, storage is approximately free, uh, so that's good. We can have as much data as we want. And then data is becoming increasingly abundant. The generation of data is being mechanized. Uh, I'd been talking about the industrial revolution of data since the early 2000s, and by 2010 it had really come about. Machines were generating data uh, at great volume in a sort of production line manner. And so the remaining bottlenecks that were interesting to look at, uh, and certainly the ones we were hearing about from friends in industry, uh, lied with people. And so I was teaming up with people in human-computer interaction. My background's in database management and uh, data analysis. And the research imperative we said was, look, we really need to dramatically simplify the people side of the equation, the labor-intensive tasks in this analytic life cycle. So that was what we set about to kind of talk about and read about and think about. Um, and what happened was, you know, good people at Berkeley, so Manish and uh, Tapan Parikh here in the iSchool, who also does human-computer interaction, particularly in, in uh, the uh, developing uh, world, uh, got together. And then we had a former student, Jeff Hare, who went off to Stanford. So we, there was a Stanford connection here at, at the end of this as well. And we just started meeting, because Jeff had moved south, we started meeting in San Francisco uh, at Adobe once a week. So Adobe hosted us, and we sat uh, in their offices, very nice offices, and we'd get together with these students. And we'd talk about research and read papers and uh, talk about our own work and try to tackle some of these, these human questions in the data analytic life cycle. So when I say the life cycle, you know, here's one candidate for, for what we meant. So you know, data has to get acquired, and uh, you know, that's actually a technical problem of its own, often uh, viewed as boring, but actually certainly very interesting. Uh, it often needs to get transformed into shape. We'll talk more about that. And then, you know, once you get it into shape, you analyze it using some of the lovely algorithms that Ben and company were talking about. You do data visualization, which are things that Manish and Jeff are experts on. And then maybe you want to build collaboration systems to get collective wisdom in an organization about what happens. So this all sounds very nice. Um, in point of fact, you know, when this happens in the real world, there's tons of feedback loops here. It's not a pipeline at all. You know, the minute you go halfway through analysis, you realize that the data got transformed incorrectly. Um, as you get to visualization, Maybe you realize that you didn't get the right data, you got to acquire some more, and so on. So there's all these feedback loops, and actually, it's not as if you can sort of build little tools and pipelines and assign people to these tasks and expect this to flow. You really have to think about organizationally how this all fits together uh, and make it very agile for people to iterate through stages of this life cycle, go back and forth, try things out, and see how things work. So there's a very significant human component. But what we did is we had students working kind of all along the life cycle in kind of a portfolio of projects manner here. And um, 
you know, what happened out of this was pretty tremendous, actually. So um, in the first two stages of this pipeline, we had two research projects that have led to two startup companies that have collectively raised over $50 million over the last couple of years. The third stage of the pipeline uh, with colleagues at uh, EMC and Pivotal, we built an open source machine learning library, which Ben Recht alluded to, actually. Uh, Chris Ray from Stanford was involved in that as well. Um, this is now in version 1.7, and Pivotal supports it very actively. Um, and then Jeff Hare's work on D3 in the visualization space is one of the most popular open source projects in the world, more popular, for example, than Linux right now on, on GitHub. So this little casual kind of gathering of folks uh, with, you know, here at Berkeley and with our, our friends who, who uh, graduated really led to some amazing stuff. So that's just a little bit of background on, you know, projects you may not hear about so much from the, the EECS department, but the kinds of just great things that happen at Berkeley. Where I'm going to focus today is on this layer of data transformation, and, and you'll get a sense why. And this is uh, what led to my starting this company, Trifacta, with Jeff and our student, Sean Kandel. So as part of the work you know, that we were doing in this life cycle, we really did want to understand where do people spend the most time. And when you go out and you talk to analysts, whether they're sort of technical data scientists or uh, business analysts in the field, you, know, you might get the sense that they spend their time either doing, you know, really hard work with engines doing you know, massively scalable things in Hadoop or Spark, or they're doing things in massively parallel SQL engines. Or maybe it's that they're doing you know, sophisticated analytics with a lot of math or beautiful data visualizations. But in fact, when you go talk to them, what they will tell you is that 80% of the work in any data project is, is actually just preparing the data for analysis. That's where the human bottleneck is. And uh, Ben alluded to this again, you know, just kind of getting the data right and getting the pipeline set up is a lot of the work. So DJ Patil, who recently joined the federal government as the data scientist, uh, I think it's the uh, data scientist for the White House, uh, wrote about this quite extensively. And then we had actually some academic work where we went out and we, we studied this issue actually through a robust uh, survey of users. So our student, Sean Kandel, went out and interviewed 35 analysts at 25 companies. Uh, relatively formally at a variety of uh, different verticals um, and people with very different titles, some of them very technical, some of them more business oriented, and asked them questions about how do you spend your day, what tools do you work with, where are your frustrations, and so on. And he wrote it up in a paper that's actually become, uh, you know, as I talk to people in my field, very useful for helping people frame what problems are worth working on. Uh, it contains a lot of anecdotal uh, quotes as well as some sort of uh, soft gathering of, of statistics and binning topics into categories. Um, so here's some of the anecdotal quotes that we heard. I spend more than half of my time integrating, cleansing, and transforming data without doing any actual analysis. Most of the time I'm lucky if I get to do any analysis at all. And this is a guy who works for a marketing firm that builds digital advertising pipelines. So recommender systems, the kinds of things that uh, uh, Google does for ad placement. They do this, they're a third party shop. And you know, he spends most of his time munging data. Um, the other thing he said right after that, so this speaks to the friction. It, you know, there's a lot of friction in, in getting these things done. Um, but the other thing he said almost just right next, which I think is very telling, is he said most of the time, once you transform the data, the insights can be scarily obvious. So this process of actually sitting and manipulating the data and munging it, you get very familiar with it as a data scientist. And um, there's a lot of people, actually, if, if you could just get their hands on the data, they don't necessarily need a lot of sophisticated statistics. They just need to be able to manipulate and spend time with the data. They start to see what's going on there. And a lot of times it's quite intuitive. Once you can kind of dig in and get past you know, looking at bits and being confused. So there's a lot of lost potential. You know, experts are wasting too much time. And then people who are maybe less expert don't have the right tools to be able to do what actually they could probably do with relatively simple uh, analyses. Um, the other thing we heard, and this was from a data scientist at LinkedIn, um, was it's easy to think you know what you're doing and not look at data at every intermediate step, but an analysis has like 30 different steps, as we just saw. Uh, it's tempting to just do this and that and then this, but you've no idea in which ways you're wrong and what data's wrong. That somehow in this life cycle of working with the data, you constantly have to come back to what is in this data, what's going on, you know, simple statistics about what it looks like and how do I manipulate it to make sure that the next step is going to make sense based on the last step that I did. Um, and so this uh, notion that there should be rich interactivity and visualization all throughout the life cycle was something that people were really hungry for. And this has become so well sort of cited and understood that, you know, even on Twitter, so there's Big Data Borat, who's a good, good fun to follow. He says, you know, in data science, 80% of time spent prepare data, 20% of time spent complain about need for to prepare the data. <laughs> Okay, this was going around at one of these big data workshops a couple, maybe a year ago. It's, uh, it's definitely well accepted in the field that this is an issue. All right, so why is this happening? Well, here's one way to think about it. You know, we are dealing with more and more data of more and more complexity than we used to. We used to just have business system data, 
in, in industry. We had you know, ERP systems and customer relationship management. Life was, life was relatively simple, supply chain management. But now what we're getting even in, in sort of every business, is not just specialized anymore, is tons of machine generated and software generated data, logs of various kinds are being landed and made available to us to use. And uh, competitive advanced businesses are using this for business advantages, right? And we, this is sort of a well-known theme and everybody wants to jump on the bandwagon. So that's great. But there's much more complexity to this data. It's much messier and more varied than it used to be, and much noisier. And we're embracing that noise. Nobody ever says garbage in, garbage out anymore, right? It's always about finding, uh, you know, finding the good things in your noisy data. So we've got lots of noisy, messy data. On the flip side, we're delivering this data in increasingly simple ways. So things like a fraud detection algorithm or a recommender system, these are things your customers just sort of expect. And they're very easy to understand and consume. These are like consumer products built on data. We didn't used to have this before. It used to be the data was in the back office and no one even knew about it. Now it's driving these very forward-facing, very simply consumable uh, products. Even things like simple dashboards and data visualizations are things that actually you know, uh, are very easy for people to understand. So how does this barbell get held up? You've got more and more complexity and you're trying to produce more and more of these simple applications. And really what ends up happening is the data scientists are in the way and the work they have to do to get from this complex data to these simple products is at the end of the day a whole bunch of data wrangling and munging and in essence it becomes a programming problem. So to get your data from one form to the form you need it is not an algorithm. All right? There's not one way to do that that's going to do it. It's inevitably bespoke. The, the data sets you have today and the product you're trying to build require you to munge that data in a very particular way. So people end up writing scripts and writing scripts and writing scripts. All right? And the question is, how can we make that consumable and easy, that task of generating all these scripts? So I worked on this actually a bunch of years ago, back in the early two, uh, 2000s. So this should say VLDB 01. That's actually a mistake. Uh, it was 9-11, actually, this conference, which is probably why I got the typo, because I'll never forget being in Rome for 9-11. Um, um, but, but this was work that we did back in 2001 just to make a visual framework for cleaning up data. It was a tool called Potter's Wheel, and it's sort of one of my favorite little pieces of work I'd done over the years. It was an isolated one paper project, but we built a kind of spreadsheet environment to transform data visually. It had underneath it a step-by-step -step domain specific language for data transformation that was, we had designed. I mean, it gave immediate visual feedback, so you got direct manipulation of the data. You didn't write scripts. You looked at data, you kind of poked around at the data, and you generated transformations visually. Um, and as it was running, it was giving you feedback on discrepancies and anomalies in your data. So you're very quickly seeing what kinds of things were going wrong. And this whole thing, because it was happening in a domain-specific language, gave you lineage as to what you had done to change this data in a high-level way, and the ability to say redo and undo steps. And this was all very nice, and we were very proud of it. And in fact, I would say now, like 10 years later, there's a number of companies that are roughly selling this. Okay, so it's become kind of a thing. You know, we were sort of, uh, this is 2001 again, but by now the idea of visual data transformation is quite well uh, uh, established in the field. The problem is, you know, after we sort of stared at this for a while is that it doesn't really help that much because we haven't really made things easier for the user. They still have to specify everything, the full burden of specification. All the work of defining a script still belongs to the user. The user still has to do it. And in essence, all we've done is we've taken a task that used to be in a language where you started with data, you wrote code, and you got results, and we lifted it into a visual domain where you start with a visual representation of the data. You have to do interactions, which are one-to-one -one isomorphic to coding. And generate visual results that you translate back down. These interactions up there amounted to the same thing as specifying commands. Pick something from a menu, fill in its parameters, get the results. It's very little different from type the command, type the arguments, get the results. So the user still has to do all the work and all the thinking. Um, you know, it, it, another way to look at it is, is users are sitting up your author, uh, I'm gonna skip through this, but they're authoring scripts, they're testing the scripts. The computer is used to visualize the output, okay? But that's all the computer does. It's very much driven by the user who sits in this domain of code. But when we look at things like Google, there are better interaction models these days, OK? Where the machine has knowledge. You start typing something in Google search, it does predictive type ahead of what you're going to get, right? And it, how does it do this? Well, it knows something about the corpus of data. It knows something about you. Um, and it knows something about uh, 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 you know, what other people who've been querying do things. It knows about query logs. And it's able to predict what you're going to do. Can we do a similar thing? for uh, programming 
uh, these transformation scripts, which is much more technical than type ahead. Okay? So we built a tool called Data Wrangler, uh, and this was Sean Kendall's work as part of the research project that roughly did this. It automatically infers what you might want to do next in these transformation scripts in a method we call predictive interaction. So I'll just skip ahead. The idea here is that rather than uh, uh, just getting you in the visual domain, what happens is when you see a visualization of, of data, you can just point at it in, a, in an ambiguous way. You sort of guide the system to, to pieces of the data that interest you, okay? And that ambiguous specification, then the algorithm goes ahead, the machine goes ahead and predicts a visualization of probable next steps. What are things you might say in your transformation language next? Let's rank order those, visualize those for you. You can disambiguate. Uh, and then we compile down to the bottom. And in essence, what we've done, I spoiled my pretty little animation, is we've moved the, the developer into the domain of visualization and interaction, and the machine now generates the code. Right? The, the user is just going to touch the data, and uh, the machine's going to suggest script steps and preview their results, and the user is going to get them. So without further ado, let me just show you a demo of how this works. And rather than show you the uh, research tool, uh, I think it'd be probably better. Oh, that's exciting to show you uh, a somewhat more polished product. So I'll show you the Trifacta commercial product. What we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, data uh, from a telco. Okay, So imagine, if you will, that you work at a telecommunications company and you're looking at customer data. Uh, and your task here is to take data from the customer data warehouse on your subscribers. Nice, clean data. As well as take messy data from the cell towers, log files from the cell towers, to figure out what call quality looks like. And we're going to try to figure out if the customers are leaving the service based on the quality of the calls that they experienced. Okay? Uh, so very quickly, to give you a sense of this, we'll create a project and we'll load up the subscriber data, which is just a dump from our data warehouse, and it's nice and clean. Um, so we'll look at this file. Um, and when we load it up in the interface, what's going to happen here is that um, the code behind here that comes from the research is going to automatically infer a script. And the script is trivial. It's doing nothing more than splitting it into rows and columns, taking the first row and turning it into a header. So this is something that Microsoft Excel might do for you automatically as well, just based on a rule. As it happens, this is happening under the covers based on a probability model about what you might do with the features of this data. But the point is this data is easy. We're going to look at more interesting data in a minute. You immediately get your eyeballs on what's going on with this data. So you have column names. You have distributions and data types for each column. So it's figured out that these look awfully like dates. Uh, and it's giving you distributions on those dates and so on. We could scroll around in this data. But you quickly get your eyeballs on the data. Okay. And you can look at this as pretty typical data for our customers. Since we're telco people, we'll notice that this IMSI is here. That's the International Mobile Subscriber ID. We know that because we're telco analysts, right? And that's going to be our, our customer ID. And just keep that in mind for a minute. Now let's load up that uh, cell tower data, the call detail records. Okay. So when we load up that file, it's going to not be so easy to deal with because it's. This is the way it came out of the log files. It's just a little bit messier. But we'll, we'll see what the algorithm does automatically, and then we'll get our hands on the data. So we load it up. And we crack it open. And this is what it looks like. So it's going to try once again to split it into sort of rows and columns. And it's not going to do a very good job. All right? We can see it didn't do a very good job, partly by these data types and distributions. It thinks that everything is text. And uh, these histograms don't seem to have any statistical patterns. Mostly uh, there's one of those and one of those and one of those and one of those and one of those. One of those. Okay? So we're not getting much juice out of the, the automatic algorithm. But hey, we're telco people. We're looking at the data. We say, look, there's our IMSI right there. Right? I want to get that out. It's like the thing after the slash. Right? It's just, I want to get it out. And that's, that's what you want to do, right? You don't want to write a program to do that. So uh, OK, let's do that. We just point at it. And what predictive interaction is going to do is, based on just one gesture, it's going to guess what we might want to do and give us a ranked list of uh, possible script steps that we might want to do to transform this data. Now, its first guess is wrong, because we haven't given it much training data. We said, look, I like IMSI. It said, cool. We can extract uh, four letter uppercase strings from your fields. Is that what you want? Um, and we might try viewing some of these other things, but I'm also going to just do this, which is, no, 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 I mean like that, you know? The thing after the slash. And then very quickly, it will start to get things right. So based on two examples now, it's generated a step in a script, extract column two after delimiter and before delimiter. And then we get some feedback, right, visually that it guessed this is of type integer. It can see that almost all of the fields here are good. They're integers, except for one. 
which is the header row. We're going to clean that up in a minute. And the data distribution is from 208 something with lots of numbers after it to 208 something with lots of numbers after it. So there's no surprises down below. This, this all looks good. So we'll just add this to the script. All right, and now we've got our IMSIs out. Similarly, you know, I want to tear this thing apart by slashes. That's an annoying thing to try to write, but I can just point at it. Okay, here's a slash. And it'll guess not only that I want to pull out one, but that it can do it, split this into three columns automatically. So we'll tear out those features. And again, you know, see very quickly, it guessed that these are date time fields based on the structure of these strings and some automatic type matching algorithms, okay, which are extensible, by the way. You can add new types and new dictionaries and new patterns to the system in your domain, and it'll learn about those too. And then the last thing I want to pull out here is the call type. And similarly to before, we'll give it a couple examples to get it just exactly right. Um, the first version didn't quite get this example, but with two examples, we get this one out. And we got our call types. And we can quickly brush over these. Those are SMS messages. That's good. Um, this all looks like the call types I expect as a telco expert. Okay, So I've pulled this all out. And now let's get this header row bumped up. So you can point at the header row. And it says, gee, would you like to promote that into the metadata? I would. And at this point, we've kind of got the data we wanted to extract, the features we wanted to extract from this text file. And we can sort of tear out some of these fields that were the source fields and just keep the derived fields that we liked. All right, so here's a nice little table of data from the call detail records. Okay. Um, disconnect reason seems to be kind of weird. There's a lot of missing values. What's going on? Well, I don't know. Let's click on that and see what it says. It suggests that maybe we want to do things where the disconnect reason is empty. But look at the histograms. When I clicked on disconnect reason, the histogram over here went all green. What happens is these are linked histograms. So every bar is being filled in with dark ink for as high as the percentage of that bar is contributed by rows in the data. The rows we've selected are the rows where disconnect reason is empty. So the dark parts of the bars are the fractions of those bars that correspond to disconnect reason empty. And you can see a very strong correlation with the call type. They're all one call type. And the duration, they're all very low duration. So what is going on here? Well, we could just kind of hover over this. These are SMS messages. The call type is SMS. And what's the duration? The duration is really low. And if we go look at the fields that are highlighted, bingo, right? This is what's going on in this data. None of this required running a correlation analysis or anything like this. This is just you know, simple inspection. Happens all the time, right? Um, and in fact, we don't want to study how long people's SMS messages took, because it's kind of noise. I want to study how long their calls lasted, and whether they ended uh, correctly or whether they ended abruptly. So I'm going to filter out these fields. These missing values, I actually don't want them, and I'll take the suggestion to delete them, right? And now look at the distribution of durations I have now. Much more reasonable distribution of call durations. Yeah. OK, so that's nice. So you can see that we're playing with the data. It's, it's just very fluid, and we're getting eyeballs on the data the whole time. There's not, nothing fancy going on here. But if you had to do this at the console and you didn't have the benefit of these continuous visualizations, you'd find that this process would take a very long time. And you'd iterate. You'd probably have run analyses already. You'd have pulled out some of these algorithms we've been hearing about earlier today, run them, and gotten weird results and not understood why. Right. OK. So. Um, we can go through more of this demo. You know, briefly, the next steps are this is per call data, and I want it to be per customer data, because we're going to join this back to our customers. So it's pretty easy, and I'll, I'll, I'll save you the time, but it's pretty easy to go in here. And with a few clicks, we can turn this into per customer data you know, and count up, for example, the number of calls that en ended with a good disconnect reason and a bad disconnect reason. Um, one thing I skipped is we can look up what these disconnect reasons are in a, uh, a code book, which is typical in an organization you have these code books. Um, get their names, which have semantics. Okay, so this is call ended and this is call dropped. And we can figure out how many calls were dropped and why, and we'll, we can get the statistics. And we'll see, in fact, at the end of this process, we get a nice table of customer, percentage of calls dropped, you know, state, zip code, location. At that point, we're ready to load it into a visualization tool, something like Tableau or Excel, and generate things like maps. Here's where the percentage of call customers with call drops is high is in the red zone, so maybe we should put more cell towers there. And here's this correlation analysis that we wanted to do at the end once the data was right, which correlates you know, whether customers have canceled or they've kept with the service based on uh, what percentage of their calls was successful. Note that the x-axis here is data from that data warehouse, just simple statistics, how long the customer has been around. The y-axis is data that we boiled out of those call detail records by pulling out all the right features and aggregating. Okay, so this is the kind of pipeline you might do in a typical analysis. So much of it, though, was just that turning those call detail records into the data we could then uh, meaningfully analyze and correctly analyze against that warehouse data. 
So that gives you a flavor of the kinds of things we can do. Um, and really, you know, the way we solved the problem was some combination of machine learning under the covers that does things like detect types from strings automatically. What are the types of these columns based on you know, code books and patterns that you might have registered in your system? Um, machine learning to detect things like outliers, okay? Uh, and then uh, machine learning to predict what uh, this predictive interaction, what you might do with these uh, data sets based on what they look like right now, what you've done in the past, and what you're gesturing at in the data as being interesting features to you. So there's a bunch of machine learning assist under the covers. And as I think Alyosha was indicating, a lot of times those algorithms don't have to be that sophisticated. But the way they're coupled together with the interaction model and the fact that what are they predicting? They're predicting statements in a domain-specific language for data transformation. So the design of that language is key to making the machine learning problem tractable. If you said I want a machine learning algorithm that would generate C code and guess what line of C code I want to write next, that would be incredibly hard. If you say I have a specially crafted small language for data transformation, then we can really predict what you're going to do next because the space of things you might say is very small. Okay, so it's this nice coupling of interaction model, machine learning, and, uh, data, and uh, sort of database language that really makes this thing hum. Okay. Um, so in sum, you know, the theme of a lot of the work that I've been doing, I, sort of one branch of my research over the past few years, has been to collaborate with people in HCI and machine learning to focus on these human bottlenecks and data analysis. There's very high impact work to be done here. It starts out sounding really blue collar, right? I'm going to build a data cleaning tool. Well, that doesn't sound very, you know, uh, fancy and academic, but it turns out there's a lot of uh, high impact to be done here, uh, which is why this has been industrialized very naturally. Uh, and it's also very interesting work. It turns out there's lots of fun to be had here. Um, and you know, in terms of impact, the customers who are using this report, things that used to take weeks now take seconds. Those kind of changes are very real and you hear them from people in the field. And you know, people say things like, my God, I wish I'd had this for the last 10 years. The amount of time I've wasted you know, makes me weep. Um, and these are real things people say to us. So this, it makes a huge difference. Um, the other thing I want to point out is the tech transfer we did in this general uh, Data to the People project really had many paths. So there were two startups, and I put a lot of time into them, uh, particularly Trifacta. But there was also, say, Madlib, which was a very active engagement with industry, with established industry, with EMC, um, to build an open source platform and take advantage of their infrastructure for things like quality assurance and testing. And you know, they have full-time staff who do these things. It's very hard to hire a QA engineer to sit on campus and really build industrial code, right? So that partnership of algorithms coming from places like Berkeley, my alumni who went to Florida, Chris Ray who is at Wisconsin, collaborating with industry people who would do things like QA and testing and then build out more algorithms has been, I think, another very fruitful tech transfer path for us. And then, you know, just camp and open source. So things like D3 and, of course, things like Spark and the Amp Lab, we've had great success with as well. And we pursue all of these things aggressively, okay? And I've personally seen all of these things work well. I don't think there's a rule for which one is better, frankly. I think you've got to do all these things. It's a real portfolio play uh, of, of ways to have impact, and I think Berkeley's been uniquely aggressive at pursuing all of these. Um, and then finally, more specifically on the topic that, that I demoed for you, this subtle interplay of these three aspects of people, data, and computation is key, I think, to this next generation of, 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 of uh, uh, easily used tools that make complex problems much more digestible. And I think there's an important thrust in computer science that we don't think about as often, which is how do, you know, this is what computers were kind of invented for, right? How do we remove drudgery from people's lives and make them better? Um, and the computing artifacts we've built have introduced so much drudgery into people's lives. And there's enormous opportunity to make all that stuff way, 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 way easier. So what this requires is this subtle interaction of understanding people, so things like interaction models, visualization models, um, understanding, in our case, data, which is our domain, right, and having domain-specific languages of really what do people do with this uh, domain so that we can capture that in a concise and meaningful way. And then finally, the sort of machine learning computation side of predicting what people might want to do based on their interactions and visualizations and the data itself. Co-designing these three things and iterating on each of these pieces and working across areas in a specific domain uh, has been a, a really a, a great pleasure intellectually and uh, of course in terms of building things that matter. So uh, that's kind of the theme. Uh, and that's it. So I'm going to get you back on time.
So the Data Wrangler project at Stanford is on, on the web, um, and you can play with it. It's open source. It doesn't do everything by any means that Trifacta does. And the code for it's on GitHub as well. So all the stuff we did in academia is open source. What I showed you was the commercial Trifacta product. It's uh, got quite a bit more functionality and polish than Data Wrangler, but you can definitely go play with Data Wrangler. for uh, tackling that in maybe small snippets as example and then running it on the entire set? I'm glad you asked, yeah. So the question was whether uh, how this works on very big data. And that's been the focus, actually, one of the key focuses of the industrial work uh, that we didn't do in Data Wrangler. So um, real briefly, this is the architecture of how Trifacta works. It doesn't actually ingest data. You point at data in a big data infrastructure. Okay, so you point at data in an infrastructure like Spark or Hadoop. We pull samples of that data up into the browser where we do the predictive interaction. And this is necessary, frankly. You, know, you can't get your hands on data until you see examples, examples of the data. And with very large data sets, you can't look at all of it with your eyeballs. Right? And so this is key. So you want to pull samples, and you want to pull samples in multiple ways, actually. Sometimes you really do want to look at the head of the file because you have to understand the structure of the file, which is often only evident in the first number of bytes. Sometimes once you know where the record boundaries are, so to speak, you want a random sample of the file. And then very often you want to stratify that sample so you see specific pieces of the data. So various sampling strategies. Once you work in the browser, all that visual work you do, you saw it was turning into script, right? We can compile that script down into multiple languages. We can compile it to Spark. We can compile it to MapReduce. We can, in principle, compile it to SQL or MATLAB or anything you might like. right? And so that framework of having that high-level domain-specific language enables us to generate code that runs then at scale. Now, the problem you have there is, well, what if the sample didn't contain the stuff that you really needed to work on? And that's where you need to have an iterative pipeline, where you run the big job. You get results, and you see data profiling of the results, which is stuff we do in Trifacta that we didn't do in Wrangler. And those results should find the anomalies in the full pass that you didn't see in the sample and bring them back for you to iterate. And this iteration essentially is on a longer time scale than that one, but that's necessary because you have to look at the full data. And then finally, when you get the script the way you like it, you, know, you can send it to your analytics tools, or you can put it in a pipeline and run it every day on a new feed. Right? And so this is sort of the bigger, the bigger life cycle of the architecture. Built out stuff, IBM. We've got about a 50 year history of specifying software and having it turn out that it doesn't do quite what we wanted. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and a lot of tools for trying to, you know, regression buckets and different ways of doing things to try to make sure it does. What I'm wondering about what you're doing is, is that you're, you're going through a lot of steps and it, how do, how do you know you're doing what you really want to do? Or is this an area where being wrong 1% of the time uh, is OK, whereas it's not so good in a bank? Yeah. <laughs> it's a delightful question. Um, and, and you're tickling um, one of my other sort of funny bones of research. Um, so in another project, I work on um, domain-specific languages for building distributed systems, which are some of the most devilishly complicated software artifacts we build. So we have a language called Bloom that we designed to build distributed systems. And in that context, where correctness really matters, because you have to deal with things like fault tolerance and message reordering in networks and all sorts of complexities, we've done a lot of work on, if you get the right domain-specific language, you can do some very powerful program analysis that we hadn't been able to do previously. So we can do things like uh, take a distributed system and instrument it and tell you exactly where you need to put in coordination logic, things like distributed locks or distributed consensus, to make sure that you, you observe correct behavior. Um, we can also test, uh, we generate exhaustive and, and correct tests for fault tolerance. So we can tell you exactly whether your system is truly fault tolerant when you say it is. So this is an important theme of research, I guess is what I want to say. It's something I think about a lot. In the context of analytics, which is a very different developer environment, these people, for the most part, analytics starts out as an exploratory process. And you want to facilitate that exploratory process. So you're much less concerned in an initial exploration of data and in building analytics, you're much less concerned about everything being just so. And you're much more concerned about agility. Okay. When you shift to productionalizing this stuff, so you're going to take the scripts you built and they're going to be fed into a recommender system, then you want to worry about correctness. But the correctness there is quite different than the software engineering correctness that I had been talking about before. So this is much closer to the stuff that Ben was uh, attesting to, where you have to want, have some statistical confidence that this thing is going to stay within bounds, right? and that it's meaningful for some model of the world that you believe is true. 
Um, and so the outputs of an analytics pipeline and the notions of correctness there are really quite different than how do I make sure my distributed system will never fail, <laughs> right? So these are, in, in some sense, two, two I, I'd love to believe they're related, and this is a topic that I've idly chatted about with Ben and others. Um, we're going to get back to it. But if the techniques here, which are really from logic, can be brought here and applied to statistical thinking. I think this is a fascinating problem. Um, so I, I answered you with a cloud of research stuff. And the reason that wasn't like, well, the answer is this, or no, we can't do it, is because I think it's a gigantic question. Software quality is an enormous challenge. Uh, and, and really, uh, again, one of the most important things, I think, in computer science, because machines can go fast. The question is, as we make them go fast, you know, do they work? Uh, and that's a very expensive problem if we don't solve it. Uh, so that's another human-facing problem, in essence, making developers productive. Great question. Got me all excited. Sorry. <laughs>